What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you all 10 Mythic Paths from Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous ranked. As I continue to wrap up my coverage for the changes in DLC, etc. that have happened over the years that have mostly brought the game to pretty close to its final state. I believe they have like one more update planned, but by and large the game is pretty much done. So I've been running back through it and I thought it might be fun to touch back with the Mythic Paths specifically and my rankings on them, which is a video I made all the way back a little after the game launched which is obviously what we're doing here. Now, an important thing to note here is that this is pretty much just my own personal preference and how I would rank these on how much I like them, which is a little bit to do with how powerful they are, sure. But for me, a combination of aesthetics, mechanics, and the narrative is really what it boils down to. So I would not pretend that this is some definitive ranking, which personally I think is a bit of a futile effort in this regard, specifically because the mythic paths were designed to be used by pretty much anyone. And while there are certainly obvious synergies like the spellbook merging for the angel and lich, certain abilities that obviously line up really well, they are nonetheless intended to be a little bit broad so they could be used by a wide variety of classes. And so to my mind, it's much less about which one of these individual paths is is the best power-wise, and more about which one of them you would build for in an effort to make the mechanics themselves shine. But with all of that said, let's actually dive into these rankings, and we are starting from the bottom and working our way towards the top, with the bottom of the barrel being the swarm that walks. Now, there's a few reasons I like this one the least, but not the least of which, because it's buggy. And yes, pun intended, but also, it's actually buggy. I regularly have trouble getting some of this Mythic Paths mechanics to work, as you are supposed to be able to use it to make clones of yourself that then act as your party members based on your Mythic rank. The thing is, oftentimes these clones don't seem to want to do anything, you can't control them. Sometimes I leave a map and they disappear entirely and the game won't let me resummon them, which can obviously be a bit frustrating. What's more though, the swarm that walks requires a very convoluted unlock, an unlock that I used my pre-release review copy of the game to track down and have ready for people on launch day, but that path specifically, the way you go about unlocking it, naturally alienates pretty much everybody, as this is the murder hobo evil for the sake of being evil path, and as a result of everything you do to get this path, everyone leaves you, which is why you need those swarm clones, and it's the only mythic path where Iomidae, a goddess, straight up attacks you. But spoiler alert, you live. Long story short though, I enjoy this mythic path for what it is. I actually think the way you go about unlocking it and piecing all that together is really cool, especially if you figure it out on your own. And I even think when it's working, the mechanics of it are really cool because you have to grow your swarm size, which then affects the damage and overall effectiveness of your abilities and the swarm that you can send out, and that's even before you start making those clones of yourselves, which are an exact copy of your own build, which can, of course, be devastating. But it's also a path where everyone leaves, which obviously cuts out a ton of content for you to experience and potentially ruin by the nature of your transformation. But of course, everyone leaving is hardly a surprise given everything that you are here. But that combined with the buggy mechanics that I mentioned, plus a mythic path story that isn't super interesting compared to the rest of them, and you've got pretty much the bottom of the barrel for me. Now just above that one though, we then have the Trickster. Now I'll be real with you, Trickster can be very effective. I know a lot of people love its mythic trick system where you take the skills of your normal character and then use them in unique ways. And a very popular one, Persuasion, will actually see enemies just dying immediately upon you entering combat if they fail a check against this skill. So you can literally just walk into combat and potentially wipe out everything in the room without even doing anything. And people really enjoy that. Then you have the sneak attack damage which can combo with stuff and it's a very strong mythic path. I won't argue with that. But what kills it for me is just kind of the silliness of it which is the point of course. But the story of this one is very haha so random type of stuff that just never really landed well with me in a story that is otherwise very serious. Now on one hand you might simply enjoy Enjoy this on a second playthrough just to give you a very different perspective of things, and it does have its moments that make me chuckle here and there. And truth be told, I think its mythic path ending 
how it concludes narratively is quite interesting. But ultimately, the tone of it is just completely off in a way that usually simply makes me avoid it unless what I'm trying to do just lines up with it too well to ignore. But like I mentioned, it does make a great second playthrough or something. At number eight, we then have the legend, or the rejection of your own power, realistically. If you've ever looked at this game and wondered if you could simply choose no mythic path, then the legend is kind of what had that in mind. Now, you still get some power in the form of an entire second class as they raise your level cap to 40, meaning that in order to hit it, you're going to have to take level 20 of one class and level 20 of another. Or, of course, any amount of multi-classing you could possibly think of, which is pretty much all this one has going on mechanically. Because, in order to achieve this one, you have to strip away the mythic power you've gained throughout the game up to that point, which serves a pretty big purpose narratively. And speaking from a story standpoint, I can appreciate the idea of a mortal going toe-to-toe -to -toe with all these supernatural forces, and what's more, you get an interaction with the big bad of the game, Arilu, that you don't really see anywhere else. So narratively, I actually do think the legend is pretty interesting. My problem with it is simply that mechanically, I'm not that into it. Now, I know a lot of people love to take something to level 40 and do all these crazy multi-classes and whatnot, but that to me is simply not as interesting as all the other mythic stuff going on, especially in terms of their narratives and how you're transforming into something more interesting than a simple mortal, I would say. So while it's not my favorite, I do find this one relatively inoffensive, and honestly, that is enough to make up for the reasons that I don't like the two previous entries. Which then brings us to number seven, and this is the revamped Devil Mythic Path. Now, this path, only available to the Aeon and the Azada, is a late game mythic path as well. In fact, it's the latest one, and it requires you to have played the game in a certain way up to that point, that I think really only makes sense if you're an Aeon. In fact, in order to get this as an Azada, you have to be acting in a way that kind of makes me wonder why you chose that path to begin with. But in any event, becoming a devil sees you allying yourself with the lawful forces of hell, which is made up of devils, as opposed to the demons of the chaotic abyss. Now, I've always enjoyed that this was an option because it makes sense, of course, that hell would be invested in the outcome of this conflict. And given that the story is all also rife with things like Hell Knights and whatnot, a mythic path that sort of answers directly to somebody like Asmodeus is really cool. Now, originally, this was a bit underwhelming on the narrative side of things, with basically only one quest that really just saw you making decisions for your crusade and nothing else. Now, you compare that now to the new quest that sees you corrupting Queen Galfrey and turning her to the forces of hell, which comes with its own story content, and I certainly think it's improved. Now, unfortunately, what has remained the same is that, mechanically speaking, it's just not that interesting of a path to me. You can use Hell's Authority to cast a few spells at will, and while they are good spells, it's not super interesting to me, and then their main thing is called Hell's Decree, where they can institute a bunch of battlefield effects a number of times per day equal to their mythic rank, which, compared to the things other paths do, wasn't quite as interesting, even when they can use their authority to authorize the use of other mythic powers, like, say, the sword mechanic from the angel mythic path. So, long story short, I think this one has gotten better, but mechanically speaking, it's still not really my favorite. And that brings us to almost the middle of the pack with Aeon. Aeon sees you turning into a cosmic arbiter of the law. A sort of space judge dread, if you would. This mythic path is all about enforcing things as they should be according to the laws of creation and also more immediate laws like the laws of any given nation or plane of existence that you might be in. It has some interesting powers in comparison to other mythic paths in that a lot of it focuses on debuffing the enemy with things like the enforcer gazes, as well as some unique buffs that will affect your character as well as your allies in unique ways, such as equalizing their base attack bonus or normalizing the size of every character in your party, and some other cool unique stuff. So mechanically, while it's certainly a bit different than all of the others, I do find it interesting to mess around with a lot of its buffs and the way it interacts with individual characters. But what keeps this from being higher up on the list, for me at least, is its overall narrative content. Because as you are becoming an Aeon, most of your mythic quests, especially early on, see you simply holding trials for people as the Aeon can see an aura of criminality against people 
who are, of course, breaking the law of their respective area in some way. And as an Aeon, you choose to get involved in that, and you'll hold these little trials. But my problem with this is, it's a little bit dull. It's mostly just talking to people and doing very little besides simply looking up the law of the land and then imposing it, which is done almost entirely through text. Now, where it does get cool, however, is the time flow stuff. At a few different points throughout the game, your Aeon can step into a rift and reset the flow of time, which leads to a really cool Aeon-specific ending that I wish it just got to a little bit faster because all the other quests besides altering time are real dull. But they do get one of the cooler endings, in my opinion. Outside of that, though, Aeon also does have some of my favorite little bits of narrative content that aren't necessarily related to anything. You see the Aeon is all about things being as they should be, which means they have power to simply force them to be that way, which translates to a lot of moments as an Aeon where you're simply talking to someone and something about them is unnatural or not meant to be, and you can use your Aeon powers to sort of just forcefully correct it such as some of the experiments being done on demons throughout the game, the age of Queen Galfrey, who is meant to be much older as a woman who is over 100 years old. And there's a lot of just fun little moments where you can interact with that that I think really add to the overall experience. Nonetheless, though, that does bring us to number five, and this is actually Gold Dragon. Now, Gold Dragon is one of those paths that I know a lot of people don't like. There are two things I could point to that I can admit I'm not wild about. One, mechanically speaking, Gold Dragon's a bit boring. You mostly just get a bunch of passive bonuses to your character, huge increases to your stats, a bunch of immunities and stuff, and you can pick three feats even if you don't meet the requirements for them. And then one of those abilities also just straight up gives your spells more damage dice. So like a lot of Mythic Paths, it's very, very strong. However, in this case, it's a little boring. I mean, mostly you're just adding on to whatever your character already is with passive bonuses. Now, on the flip side of that, I will say the Gold Dragon has probably the best transformation compared to all of the other ones, which can look, frankly, a little bit goofy, but the alterations this one makes to your actual character model are a bit more striking than a lot of the others, at least as far as I'm concerned. But another reason you'll hear people complain about Gold Dragon is the story content related to it. Now, it did get a lot more than Devil did, but a lot of people weren't wild about the actual content involved in those several more quests. But I'm going to say something controversial here, potentially, and that is simply that I don't agree with that sentiment. Outside of one thing, which is simply that part of the Gold Dragon quest is a side quest that everybody can do. However, looking beyond that, the Gold Dragon also gets a quest to simply become a Gold Dragon, their transformation quest, which sees you doing what every other Mythic Path does, basically, which is go to a bunch of locations, interact with something, and then come back, more or less. Now, in the Gold Dragon's case, that is literally three different errands for people that seem to be meaningless, such as going and grabbing a certain cheese from the tavern in Dresden. But gold dragons being beacons of goodness and hope and helping people for the sake of helping them, I honestly think it makes a ton of sense. And then the other two quests in this line see you directly fighting evil dragons or interacting with them in some way. So the rest of the transformation quest, you go rescue a baby dragon from a black dragon that is trying to get its hands on it, and that's the side quest that everybody can do. And fair enough, it's not really unique to the Gold Dragon. But after this, if you've been following along, you can talk to your mentor, Hal, who helped you along the journey, and he'll send you to interact with Savalros, a corrupted dragon. And if you've been to the City of Iz already, you can actually fight Terindalev there, the dragon from the opening scene of the game. And as a Gold Dragon, you can speak to her remains and convince her sort of Draco Lich form here to continue to fight corruption and fight off the forces of evil in her current form. And if you've done this, you get conversations with Savalros that make it easier to pull him back towards the light himself. And I think a lot of that is pretty well done. So that combined with a pretty unique mythic path ending, and I don't agree that this one is as sparse on content as people make it out to be, but I will concede mechanically. A little dull, fair enough. Which brings us to number four, via the Lich. Now the Lich can merge their spellbook with full arcane casters to get level 10 spells, which is honestly, mechanically speaking, reason enough to play as this one. Provided, of course, you want to be evil, and thus a Lich. But the flip side of that is it's pretty heavy on spellcaster stuff, as you might imagine. There are obviously other things you can do with it, but it does kind of feel like it's tailored more towards spellcasting. But lucky for us, 
The Lich does have one really, really cool thing you can do, which is simply raising up some of the people you find along the way to act as undead companions. You can get a full roster of undead companions, which has the added benefit of all of you being undead, and thus you can do things like channel negative energy at zero threat to yourself. And obviously, all of these individual companions have tiny little bits of story themselves that make the concept and class fantasy of being a lich very real. And I think they certainly nailed that part of this. But the story of this one, also pretty good. You find yourself building a ziggurat, a pillar of skulls, all sorts of undead minions, all while you search for a way to transform into a proper lich, which is itself an ordeal, mind you, but after it's done, you can then sort of go to war with Phrasma herself and her hatred for undead abominations like yourself who defy the wheel of fate by preventing souls from going to their final judgment, and it's a lot of fun. Realistically, the only reason this is a bit farther down is simply that I find Zacharias kind of annoying and I don't like dealing with the guy, and even if you kill him at the end, it feels a little forced because apparently he's helping you transform into a lich all this time, but it's like if he decided to kill you, why would he go through with that? And like, yes, he made a deal, but it just seems a little silly. But even I can't deny that as an evil mythic path, the class fantasy of being a lich, the strength of some of its mechanics, especially if you build around the fact that you're going to be undead, can make for a very unique playthrough that scratches a very particular itch, and I'm pretty fond of that. Which then brings us to the angel mythic path at number three. I would say kind of the default mythic path, and they kind of seem to have understood that when they started making the story for this one. It's very fleshed out in comparison to others. There's a lot of great quests. They tie into the main events very, very well, giving you extra sort of holy options and attempt to either save someone or simply bring righteous justice. If you are a divine caster, you can also merge their spellbook with the angel, but even if you're not a divine caster, they have things like the area of effect from your halo or your sword mechanics that will buff up your and potentially allies weapons. So it's a lot of fun mechanically being able to do a lot of things. It's got some of the best story content being what is effectively the default good path, which also fits really well into the setting. All makes it quite good overall. And while it's certainly a little stock standard, there's really no downside to it otherwise, which is what it's doing so high up. But then for number two, we have the Demon Mythic Path. Now, I'm a fan of this specifically because it flips the entire narrative on its head. You're meant to be leading these holy crusades, but you yourself are wielding demonic power, which you can choose to embrace in a way that should definitely have more people stepping up to stop you in some way, which happens surprisingly rarely across all the paths, only a couple of them lead to companions actually leaving. And while much of the mythic path is all about unleashing your demonic rage, even this can lead to some unique narrative moments, especially in Act 4 where you are in the abyss where demons are from, and as the demon mythic path, that plays out very differently than it does for every other mythic path at that point. And that's before you get into the conspiracy in Act 5 that can, based on your choices, see you coming into a proper position in the hierarchy of the Abyss in a way that feels very satisfying to play. Now, what keeps this from being the number one spot for me, truth be told, is that I just don't like the rage mechanics that it focuses on, as you can enter a demonic rage for combat, basically, and then you can activate all these aspects to get bonuses to that rage, and it's a really neat idea. I know people love their barbarian and blood rager type stuff, but if I'm being honest, I'm just not wild about rage as a mechanic overall, and while I'm certainly capable of using it, it is legitimately what keeps this from being the number one spot for me, which then brings us to the number one spot, which by process of elimination continues to be Azada. Now I'll be real with you, is Azada a bit of a cringe fest at times where it's sort of freedom for the sake of freedom and things working out when they absolutely shouldn't? Yes, it is. You also get the companion Ivu, who is a childish havoc dragon, which can itself lead to some silly moments, which you might be thinking, isn't that what you criticize the trickster mythic path for? And while that's a fair enough observation, I would say that Azada tends to hinge more on the naive side of things, which is a fair bit different than, say, the trickster specifically. But fully leaning into this mythic path and then interacting with the goddess Desna, as well as the Azada from Elysium, which can see you do things like recruiting Arushale a little early and then 
the romance for her, as an Azada is especially touching. But then there's things like using the Azada to properly destroy the flesh markets or the slave market in the Abyss after they attempted to kidnap your dragon, and it's moments like those that are just really, really fun. And that's before we start talking about mechanics. Ivu is a full-fledged companion. It's a dragon that joins your party, and once she gets big enough based on your mythic rank, you can actually use her in mounted combat, which pairs really well with classes like Cavaliers, which is something unique from all of the other mythic paths for sure, and you get to have Ivu in addition to any other animal companions you have. Later on, she becomes an especially adept healer with a fear presence and a breath weapon. But then we have things like superpowers, which are huge sweeping buffs to our characters, such as life bonding friendship, which will keep your companions from dying under certain conditions, which combined with the last stand mythic ability makes your entire party exceptionally difficult to kill. And for me, you've got a mythic path that's a ton of fun narratively. The mythic path ending even makes sense in terms of healing the land. Mechanically, it's great. And while I will fully admit that these are not typically the kinds of story elements and whatnot that I enjoy, I just always find myself really looking forward to the Azada side of things. And overall, it's just a ton of fun as there are worse things than a story about adventure, freedom, and fun. But that is where we're going to wrap up this particular video. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. If you did, do let me know down below how you feel about all of these mythic paths. I know a lot of people get caught up in comparing them power level wise, but that's never really been my jam. So hopefully nobody's too disappointed about that. But in any event, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.